So good evening again, and welcome to the 22-23 uh, budget hearing. So I'd like to start with our long-term goals and our financial accomplishments. Um, we began planning long-term goals back in the 2016-17 school year when I began. Um, the Board of Education, Superintendent, um, and I um, discussed many things that we felt we needed to what we needed to accomplish. So one of the um, goals was to limit our tax levy increase to the best of our ability. And um, I believe you see my little check mark for the past three out of the past four years, we have come in below the tax levy cap, meaning that the cap allows us to tax up to a certain amount based on a formula. Um, and we have chosen to come below that amount by $1.3 million. Um, I think that is a significant um, achievement by the school district. Capital Reserve Fund, um, we managed to allocate $6.2 million in the beginning of uh, 2016 to 2019 to help offset the 2019 bond projects. And we wanted uh, to improve our district, district fiscal rating. We got an upgrade to AA2, which is uh, a very good rating for a district of our size. It's a good rating in general, but even more so for a district of this size. Um, we just recently had a Moody's analysis, which was posted and is on our website, where we continue to maintain this even in these difficult times. And it was very clear, if you read on the first page, that one of the reasons why we continue to carry this is due to our conservative budget, budgeting, which allows us to have surplus at the end of the year and continue to build our reserves. Reserves are needed in case of emergencies. And anybody in this school district knows that we've seen our share of emergencies. Did it change? No. Okay. Additional uh, long-term goals was removing the dependency on the capital reserves to support our annual plant maintenance and annual capital projects. So what this is, um, we previously would reserve, um, rely on the capital reserves for any maintenance um, for the plant and any um, annual small capital projects. Um, that is not a um, good way to run your school district. These things should be part of your oper general operating budget so that there is money there on an annual basis to address these needs. You can't constantly re rely on reserves for things that are annual maintenance projects. Um, so we have completely come off of the capital reserves and these um, areas have been brought back into the operating budget. In addition, we were relying on $1.5 million in the 2016 school year, 16-17 school year, to bridge the gap between the expected expenditures and our anticipated revenues. Again, not a way to uh, be supporting your budget. It's like taking money out of your savings account to meet your car loan. Eventually your savings account is gonna run out. So one of our biggest goals was to get off of a dependency on reserves and bring that money and kind of get our budget aligned with the anticipated revenues. To date, we've reduced it by 1.4 million out of the 1.5 million. Again, we had anticipated having um, removed our dependency on reserves completely by this, uh, by actually the 2021 school year. But of course, COVID has changed a lot of things and kind of put a lot of our goals and planning a little, pushed it a little back further. We are now only relying on $100,000 from reserves. Um, another goal was to reduce our dependency for technology replacements. Our hardware technology uh, plan was developed a couple of years ago. Uh, technology has become an extremely important part of our instructional program. And again, we were relying on reserves to replace our hardware. 
hardware and we haven't we have expanded our hardware. We've gone all the way to um, three to 12 for one-to-one -one initiatives and built that into the budget as we expanded our one-to-one -one initiative. And right now we're still relying on $100,000 annually out of the reserve fund. That's why you see a little box because that is our next, um, that's the only goal right there that we have not met and our uh, plan is to meet that by next year. Capital Reserve Fund for Future product Projects. We closed our last Capital Reserve Fund and we applied it to the 2019 bond to reduce the debt service and the cost to the taxpayers. At this time, we feel it's time to recreate a new one so that for the next five to 10, maybe 15 years, we can start to accumulate funds in that reserve. And again, we'll be in a good position to offset capital expenditures in the future without an impact to the taxpayers. So that's still um, got a little box, but it is one of our propositions for this year. The thing with a reserve fund is that it requires um, community input to create it, to fund it, and to expend it. So the money is put there, and then we would need the community vote to allow us to use it for specific purposes. So this is our budget process. We begin in, in we begin in the fall. We had four public work sessions. All of them are posted um, on the website for you to go and revisit. Um, and then we had our budget adoption on April 12th. Our vote is next Tuesday, and this is of course the budget hearing. As you all know, back in ooh, several years, 2015 was it? We um, I wasn't here. The Board of Education, the superintendent, and the community um, developed uh, a five-year strategic plan. Um, and we have determined uh, four focus areas. When we build our budget, all initiatives and all expenditures take these areas into account. We don't add anything or remove anything unless we look at these four goals. Currently, we are um, in the middle of a strategic plan to develop the next five years. So I'm not going to read all of this to you. I put it in the presentation because for those of you who have time, there are presentations up here at the table. For those of you who are at home, this will be posted on the website. I think it's important for you to understand, based on that strategic plan, what have we done to support it? What have we added? What initiatives have we taken into place? Not just what initiatives for this year, but what initiatives have come out of that strategic plan to improve this program, um, the instructional program for our students. And so you'll see this is our, our staff. I can, I'd be happy to explain that. We do use a lot of jargon in, in uh, education, so I apologize for that. So AIS is Academic Intervention Services. Those are for students who are struggling learners that are not reading on grade level, they're kind of lagging behind. So those are services in math and English language arts. So we, we provide those academic services for those students. ENL is English New Learners. So those are students who come into our schools and um, are not native lang English language speakers, and we give them support in learning the uh, English language. Okay. So this is the staff that we've um, increased. These are student opportunities that we've done over the last several years. Quite a bit of them, quite a long list. Um, and again, at your, at your leisure, you're more than welcome to review this. Um, these are other programs that we've brought into the district over the last several years. All of this under, at or under the tax cap. Additional funding to support a lot of new curriculum, um, a camera system so that they, home games could be live streamed and the community can watch them for free. So we've done a lot of really um, great things over the last several years. These are the facility improvements that we've um, implemented. You see, we've got new vehicle, new buses and vans. 
new adult edu uh, new um, adult education. That shouldn't say that. It should say um, driver education. You know, so I'm reading it right, but that's not what it should say. So I will correct that. That's a new driver education vehicle. So it has all the safety features of the most recent cars. Our a vehicle was old. It was um, in need of a lot of repairs. And it didn't have a lot of the safety features of the most recent, of the newer vehicles. So we felt it was time to purchase a new one so the students were learning on a vehicle in which they will be driving in the future. These are facil additional so facilities improvements. Again, these are right in the general fund budget. We are no longer relying on reserves. And these are many of the projects that we've done over the past five years. So our security enhancements, security for the Board of Education and the superintendent and administration has been a top priority. And over the last several years, we've made significant investments, um, creating a safe environment for our students and our staff. Um, so this is a list of what has been implemented in the past five years. So let's get to what we're really here for, the 22-23 budget. So currently we're running on a $41.7 million budget for the 21-22 school year, and we're proposing a $42.6 million budget for the 22-23 school year. That's an increase of 869,000, or 2.08% budget to budget, which is significant, that's a pretty low number when you take into account contractual increases. However, it's important to note, and I write this here because it's, it's unusual. Um, living with the, we had a Living with the Bay project here, um, discussions about uh, getting the funding and the improvements here to the district facilities began back in 2015 before I even began here. And they continued um, until the projects were completed here in 2022. So this was a seven year process. And what the district gained from this was the bulkhead around our high school fields, which we desperately needed. Um, a high school parking lot in the back of the building was repaved. We got a generator for the high school uh, and they uh, renovated a high school basketball court. All this done by the Living with the Bay with no cost to the district. However, for the seven years of work, time and effort in the planning and implementation and design of this project, um, they, re they agreed to reimburse us $230,000. So we are receiving that. We received part of it already, and we expect to receive the, the remaining amount by the end of this school year. So that was money or revenue that was unaccounted for. So we decided, well, what are we gonna do with that? We should really use that money for projects that the district needs that we don't have the source of funding for. And so we decided since all of the renovations and benefits that we got from living with the Bay, were here in the high school, that we should use that to fund some upgrades that are needed in the elementary buildings. So when that revenue comes in, we have earmarked that revenue to be held and used to offset the cost next year. And we're using $230,000 to replace, to, as a portion of replacing our five playgrounds at the, at the elementary buildings. And I'll discuss that a little further. So ultimately, if you really think about it, our budget to budget increase is only $639,000 or a 1.53% budget to budget increase. That includes keeping all of our instructional programs, keeping all of our staffing, and adding enhancements. These are the district initiatives that we are adding for the current 22-23 budget. We're um, you going to hire a literacy coach, which we already have hired, uh, who will begin in the 22-23 school year to uh, assist at the elementary buildings. We are uh, purchasing new health curriculum for both our middle and high school students. Um, 
replacing the computers in the high school library. We have continued to support and expand our enrollment in CTE programs. I believe, I don't know, what is it, six or seven years ago, we had um, room for five students in the budget, and we are now in the 22-23 supporting 23 students attending the CTE programs. And this year in 22-23, we're going to roll out our NASA Community College concurrent enrollment program. So a lot of really good opportunities for our students. Again, in a budget-to-budget -budget increase of 1.53%. Additional opportunities, um, we have the uh, Rock Orchestra, which is now going to be official club. Um, it has been running for the last couple of years on a volunteer basis. This will ensure that this uh, Rock Orchestra will continue long term. Um, the other areas that we're increasing is we're putting a junior high school winter track coach, an assistant coach for our varsity winter track. And as you know, with our new track, we are getting a larger interest. Um, so our programs are growing. And then we're going to increase our intramural programs. And that's going to be which specific programs we roll out will be based on interest for the 22-23 school year. So the capital improvement proposal, again, all funded through the general fund budget, and this is where $230,000 will be used um, to support this project. And why now? Well, we have several of our playgrounds are at or near their life expectancy. So we have seven playgrounds. Um, five of them will be addressed this year. In addition, there's been a lot of concerns about the cleanliness of the current playground surfacing, which consists of tire shreds, and this has raised many concerns from our community. Um, this is directly aligned to the focus of health and safety uh, when determining capital projects, which is one of the things we look at. Since health and safety is something that um, could be covered with federal stimulus funding, we applied and were uh, approved to use our federal stimulus funding, which is outside of um, general funding. It's additional money we get from the federal government, is outside of tax levies and, and the residents. And so we will use that to cover 80% of the replacement of the surfacing material. So we no longer have the concerns of cleanliness. Then we have an E-rate opportunity. The district is very focused on using every option we can to benefit the school district at the least cost to the taxpayer. As you saw, the federal stimulus funding, using the Living with the Bay funding for our playgrounds, and E-rate opportunities is something we do each year. And we use that money um, to uh, improve our technology um, at a very limited cost to the taxpayers. So this year, the project is going to be putting additional firewalls at each building, um, and that will protect us from cyber breaches spreading from one location to the other. So should there be a cyber breach here in a high school, the additional firewalls will prevent it from spreading to Rame or to Center Avenue. And, addition, and we're going to have an, an addition of a new outdoor rated network switch for our press box. And that has to do with a lot of the information we discussed earlier about improving our technology. So E-rate projects are reimbursed at 50% from the federal government. So the total um, anticipated cost of this project for the current year is 32,500. We expect 50% reimbursement F16250, which leaves the district outlay at 16,250. And then we already bid out the project and BOCES won the project. So we will then see a 67% aid returned on that cost, which will equate to a $10,887. So ultimately a $32,500 project is costing the taxpayers 
So this is just another way that we utilize options and programs to save the taxpayers' money. It's an ultimate savings of $27,000 to the taxpayers. So this is the three-part uh, expenditure budget, which it takes our overall expenditure and it divides it by three different components. As you can see, the biggest part of our budget is expended on program, and that's where it should be. And then there's the capital, and there's the administrative portion. This is the breakdown by dollar amount, what we spend, what our budget for the 21-22 school year was for each component, what we are proposing for the 22-23 school year, and what the increase was. Again, you can see the bulk of the increase is their program, and that's where it belongs. So just to give a little bit more detail what each component um, contains. The administrative component is the Board of Education costs, central administration and uh, building, the central office and building administration, the entire business office, insurance, auditing, legal, and our district clerk. And it's a $108,000 increase, and of that $108,000, $35,000 alone is for insurance. Flood insurance continues to increase here. Um, and there's just no way around it. Every year you see this, this year's a little bigger. Um, every year I'm talking about, it's a $5,000 increase, it's a $10,000 increase. But we are required by FEMA to keep a very large amount of uh, flood insurance if we want FEMA assistance should we have another event like Sandy. So we have no choice but to keep an extremely high coverage. And so as it goes up, so does our expenses. Program component, again, the most important part of the uh, budget. This is our students. It's our instructional staff, our social workers, our psychologies, psychologists, our health services, all instructional materials, all of our transportation costs, athletics, co-curricular athletics. And this is where most of the district enhancements, I would say the majority of the district enhancements are included in this part of the budget. And then there's the capital component. This has to do with facilities, basically, our security, our custodial and maintenance staff, operations and maintenance of our buildings, debt service, and capital projects. Again, I keep reminding everybody, we're no longer res uh, relying on reserves. We've completely brought this into the general operating budget, which is where it belongs. Um, and there's only a $44,000 increase in this component. So let's talk about the revenues. There are many sources of revenues, and they are all listed there. I'm not going to read them to you. This is the revenue breakdown. We do, in fact, have an increase in state aid. I know there was a lot of uh, confusion based on Newsday articles. I'll explain that a little better in the next slide. Um, but we do, in fact, have an increase in our state aid. Um, and then there's various areas. Um, we uh, get revenue from services, which is like tuition. We do have some tuition students from other districts that come and attend our very well-received uh, life skills program and which we charge the other districts. Obviously, pilot interest for uh, money in our account. And then there's the appropriated fund balance. So we'll talk a little bit about the appropriated fund balance. There's a lot of discussion about the district having a large amount of fund balance going around. And there is a lot of confusion as to what fund balance is and why do we have so much left over and what do we do with it? Well, around March, February, March, we begin to really look at what our expenditures are coming in. What what is based on our budget, like anybody's budget, it's never, you know, dead on. It's a budget. It's an estimate. And so we look at where our, our staff is. Do we have a lot of staff that's on a leave of absence? We tend to have a lot of staff that's been on leaves over the last couple of years. Um, and then when we uh, fill their roles, we hire staff members at lower salaries. You know, so there's many reasons for balances in the fund balance. There's always money built there for unexpected uh, emergencies. 
but we anticipate having $1.1 million. And what we do with that money is we don't just absorb it. We are actually returning it to the taxpayers and it's offsetting a tax levy. Um, so it's decreasing your tax levy. Uh, this year we are almost $900,000 below what we could based on the cap imposed as a levy and the excess fund balance annually goes towards reducing that. Uh, and then there's that living with the Bay funding, the money that we received for administrative um, oversight and planning for the Living with the Bay project over the past seven years. And so I've also earmarked that to be returned to offset the playground. And then there's your tax levy, which is about a less than $300,000 increase for the current year. Yes, yes. It's yes, correct. It's money, unanticipated money this year um, that made sense to fund a project that would be quite costly to the taxpayers. So here's the New York State budget um, earlier this month, actually last month. Um, the budget came out at $7.5 million. And when I compare it, I compare it to what did we build the budget this year, the 21-22 budget. It, it doesn't make any sense to compare it to anything else because when we're doing budgeting, we're looking at increased or decreased revenue compared to what we received for this year. So this year we budgeted 7.6 million. They're telling us we're gonna get 7.5 million, which is a decrease of 75,000. But everybody else got increased in foundation aid. And this has been the topic of conversation and the biggest confusion in the community. And I've, I've had many conversations with many community residents. Um, we were fully aware that our building aid was going to decrease significantly in the 22-23 school year. And it went down by $800,000. And we knew that. We knew that in 2016, 17. And we've been discussing this at budget meetings. It's what brought about our bond project for 2019. And why did it go down? Because a 2005 bond, the aid is now being fully funded. And this is the year it's starting to roll off. So when we started the conversations, we started a facility committee in 2017. Um, and we started public conversations and public meetings as to, okay, now's the time to start to consider um, additional bond projects that the district needs. The old bond is rolling off. We want to take on a new bond. We want to address concerns in here in the district. And we want to make sure we time it so that we have our borrowing, debt service, additional money we have to lay out, and time it so that the state aid, the building aid that we get on our projects all comes in at the same time to produce a zero impact to the taxpayer. And so we worked for years to make sure we did that. So we were aware of this was coming. This was not a surprise to us. Um, so it did go down. What is not reflected in the state aid numbers is we have several projects that we're working on currently that will be finalized and I will close out before the end of the 22 school uh, calendar year. And that's where the $419,000 comes from. The interest rate right now is 3.2%. No, it's not variable, it's fixed. So um, what I did, because the state cannot calculate our building aid until they have a final cost report. That's a report that's filed by the district when the Project is completely done. Checklists are all finalized. And we say the project's done and all expenses are paid. Because we are not going to pay our contractors until our punch list is completed. And we're satisfied with the project. At that point, I file a report with the state. And that triggers the building aid. So the state can't calculate that for me. Because they don't have my numbers. They don't have my report but I can calculate it because I know what the projects are costing and I know which projects will be filed and completed before December of 22. 
And as long as these projects are filed and completed before December 22, that's the state aid in addition that we will be receiving as building aid. So I added that back in because I know we're going to get it. So our increase overall is a 344,000. No. Well, it was a decrease. We anticipate a slight increase. We had a decrease two years ago, went up slightly, and we anticipate a slight more increase. Excuse me? You know what your 12th grade is all? 90? Yeah, okay. I'll let yeah. It fluctuates between, uh, it's been as low as about 75 to about 100. Yeah. 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 Depending on the year. Now, English and second language, how many students have they answered that program? I don't have that exact number, but I can also get, I can also get that number to you. I don't want to give you the wrong information. Um, the number has been increasing. It, I believe it's about 55 students. But, excuse me? No, there, this is K-12. In grades K through 12, all the students are, they're not in a class, they're integrated in their regular classes and grades and they receive the services depending on their level of uh, their level of learning, um, they receive a different amount of services, either one or two periods a day uh, of support uh, no. services. Okay. So this is foundation aid, um, something that was promised to us many, many, many years ago. We were flat for several years. Last year, they um, committed to giving us foundation aid over a three-year period and bringing us up to where we belong. Um, last year, we got 329,000. Um, the governor uh, committed to uh, that plan. She gave us 50% of the balance for this year, and we are expected to get the 50% of the balance next year. Um, the foundation aid number went down a little bit than from last year. And that's because we did have a declining enrollment the prior year. It's always a year behind. Um, so it did impact us. Um, but for the most part, we should be getting uh, almost a almost million dollars that they owed us over a three-year period. And then that will continue to come. So this is the use of reserves that we talked about slightly um, earlier in the uh, presentation. Again, um, we have significantly decreased our reliance on reserves. And think of reserves as a savings plan, uh, savings account, money you have there in case of emergencies, unforeseen um, uh, spikes. For example, what's going on right now? Unforeseen spikes in, in costs and inflationary costs. Well, what we would do is we would use the fund because reserves are set up for specific costs. All right, so I have a reserve for the employee retirement system. So if we needed uh, money next year, if there was a loss of state aid, um, what we would do is we would offset some of the employee retirement system with a reserve, and then we would use the balance, the other general fund revenue to offset. What, no, what this is showing you is in 2016-17, when we first started discussing this, we used to use about $1.5 million. We are now down to using only 100000 So we're not draining from the reserves. We're letting the reserves stay there in case of a, a, a need in the future. We shouldn't be using, you shouldn't be taking money out of like a savings account as an everyday uh, to fund everyday costs. That should be there in case of emergencies. So this is the tax levy cap in accordance with the New York State law. This is not our tax levy increase, it's the cap. So every year we have to do a calculation based on f five different variables. One is consistent across the state of New York, the other four are independent and unique to each and every school district. So when you look in the newspaper, you may see that um, East Rockaway has a 3.81 cap and Lynbrook might have a 
we're not doing anything wrong. They're not doing anything right. It just happens to be based on multiple variables that, the, that are inside of the calculation that has been set by New York State. So every year I, I present this, and I'm supposed to let you know, based on the cap, what is the maximum amount of levy that I can impose against uh, our taxpayers where we only need a simple majority. If I were to go over that levy, I would need a, a, a super majority. So nobody really goes over the levy. But many districts stay right at the tax cap. And we did for many years. But as I said earlier in the presentation, one of our goals was to be able to bring in a good, strong um, budget with enhancements for the students and not have the tax to the maximum, especially when you have a tax cap at 3.81%. Um, this year is a little bit higher. But since it's been in place, the tax cap um, formula over the last 11 years, our average in this school district, the cap was at 2.21. That's what the average was, and that's what we could have increased. But that's not what we're increasing. So this screen shows you what the tax levy increase is. For the 22-23 school year, Although our cap was 3.81, we're putting out a budget that is, um, that's, is supported by a 0.93% increase to the tax levy. So that's 2.88% below the tax levy cap, which is a significant difference. Um, and if you see, three of the past four years, we have brought in our budgets below the tax levy cap. So we've asked... We've put out strong, sound budgets, maintaining, improving our program, and yet managed to do it without increasing our tax, the uh, cost of the taxpayers at the maximum amount. We've kept it below. And since the tax levy cap has gone into effect, the average increase for this district has been 1.84% over 11 years. That, that's really an incredible um, number very low considering all the improvements we've done um, in the district. Well, they were. We had 2001 and a 2002 bus. Um, so uh, both of, we had a van in 2002 and the 2001. Very old, a well maintained, but what was happening is we weren't able to get some of the parts. And then our driver was going from one junkyard to the next until he found it, and it was starting to get a little frightening. So this is the estimated impact of the tax levy to our average homeowner. Again, we get the average assessed value from Nassau County. We don't have anything to do with assessed values. Assessed values on our, our property is done strictly by Nassau County, although they like to put East Rockaway School District phone number in big, bold print, we have nothing to do with the assessed values. Um, they're telling us the average is $458. Um, that's based on a report provided in April of 2022, meaning this uh, budget would be an increase of $101 annually. So in this... Um, budget vote, we have three additional propositions. So you will see four propositions on your ballot this year, a little bit more than we're typically used to. So I just want to go through what each one is. First, capital reserves. What is a capital reserve? I think we've covered this probably several times already. Um, it's a savings account. It's kept separate and outside of our operating budget uh, for expenditures. For specific uses, it must be authorized by the voters, and usually through a proposition or a special vote. Um, they're different from operating budget because their, their expenditures come from the reserve funds, and you have to authorize those specific uses. And it's no additional cost. It's, money's already there. It's already sitting in the reserve for specific purposes. And then we have to present it and the community decides whether or not we should move forward. Uh, 
I'm sorry, let me go back that I have a number. We had a $6.2 million capital reserve fund that we applied to the 2019. So once we exhaust it, if we were using a piece, I think I'm going the wrong direction here. Hold on a second. Let me... Yeah, if we exhaust it totally and we have funded it completely, we have to reestablish one. For the technology, I, I did uh, recommend that we use the $100,000 out of our technology reserve. And you'll see that that's in the next slide. Okay, let's go. Okay. We skipped over Proposition 2. <laughs> it's going the wrong way. Okay, here we go. Okay, so Proposition, the second Proposition, Proposition 1 is your budget vote. Always there is Proposition 1. You're voting on the budget for the following year. Anything after that will be Proposition 2, 3, 4, whatever. Proposition 2 is that $100,000 used for technology. We, we, that is the only reserve we are using annually for what is basically general operating expenses. A goal was to not be relying on this, the supplemental hardware replacement plan, but our technology needs have expanded tremendously during COVID. Um, and so we've only got it down by $100,000, and our plan or hope is that next year we will be completely off of the use of reserves. This is to no additional cost to the taxpayers. The money is already in the reserve. We just need approval from the taxpayers to utilize it to support our plan. I hate not having it. Okay, Proposition 3, the third proposition you'll see, is the establishment of a capital reserve fund for building improvements. I call it number three because we've had two already. What this is, is establishing um, for future capital projects. So I talked about the $6.2 million that offset our bond. That reserve was capital reserve for, for improvements and repairs too. That's closed. We used all of that money that was accumulated since 2004 to offset the cost of the bond so that there was $6.2 million that we did not have to fund and we, we did not have to tax the taxpayers for or take debt service from. So what this is, again, long-term planning. We obviously are addressing our needs right now, but we know in the future we will have other needs. So now's the time to establish a new one and when there's money available, we will fund it. So uh, the term will be 15 years, which is right when the 2019 bond will expire. Um, we're going no more than 15 million plus any interest that we accrue. It will be uh, funded if there's any excess funding um, from expenditures, we will allocate it to the reserve. Uh, we can allocate other reserves there if we need it. Um, it enables um, the district to reduce the cost of the taxpayers by using these funds, again, for uh, large capital projects without having to borrow. Um, it and the key to this and the most important part of this is there is no um, spending from this without voter approval. This is for the future. This is in the next... This is probably for 15 years from now. So what we're doing is every year, we, we're going to be going out every 15 years or so. When one bond expires, we'll probably go out for more capital improvements because the district will need some, some upgrades in 15 years. So this is long-term planning. So we create it, we accumulate funds, and then in 15 years when we start to, well, actually probably 12 years, when we start to talk about What's going to happen? The 2019 bond is going to expire. Building aid is going to roll off. Debt service, which is like your payments, your loan payments, is going to roll off. What projects does the district need now? And there will be money set aside to offset those costs. 
Right. And this is. This is for the future. This is not a bond. This is a, a, a like a savings account that will put money in for the future. Just like we use the six point two million for the for the um, two thousand nineteen bond, we had a fund like this that was set up fifteen years before that. Well, that's up to. That's not to exceed. That's not. That's not to exceed, and it's not like we're asking for taxpayer money. That's a cap. It's just a cap. The last one we had was seven million. If we get, well, this isn't a bond. It's a savings account. No, 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 no. This is like having a savings account. It's like, well, we have a special account. And then if there's excess funding, we can put it in there. We're not taking, we're not borrowing, we're just accumulating funds over the next 15 years so that when we're ready to do more capital projects, when the 2019 bond expires, we will have money set aside to offset the cost for the tax base. This comes from any excess funds from the budget. So if I go out and I have a budget, um, and there's money left over because I have a lot of leaves or I have reduced expenditures, maybe my transportation costs come in lay lower, and then we have excess funding, we can put it in this savings account so that in the future, the taxpayers do not have to fund. Not this, we couldn't. But before, but we could use fund balance to do that. Like I do, like I showed you, we use a million dollars every year. We would do that first. We would reduce our tax levy first, and then excess funds would go into here. This is only long-term planning um, to enable us to not have to take out so much bond borrowing in the future. Um. But it's no cost to the taxpayers, as I put up there. That's what this that's what this is about. So that I can try and explain it. Um, it's really setting up a savings plan for future. It's long-term planning, and it's setting up an account like we did in 2004, and then we used that money in 2019. It's the same concept. It's now we've exhausted the prior one so that we offset the costs from the taxpayers for the 2019 bond, and we are now work doing the exact same thing. Okay? Okay. All right. And then the last proposition, Proposition 4, is transportation eligibility. So why do we have this proposition on? This is a petition submitted from our residents. Um, the purpose is to revise the mileage guidelines uh, to provide transportation to students in grades K to 8 who reside at least one mile from the school they legally attend. So basically what it reduces, our, our current policy is that we provide transportation for students K to 8 who live two or more miles. This petition, which was submitted by residents, is asking us to provide transportation for students who live one or more miles. So it's actually increasing the transportation the district would provide. Well, we are required to put the proposition on because it was submitted by the residents. So we submit the proposition to the residents, we, we respect the community, and then the community in whole has the right to approve or disapprove this. Um, and this revision is not only K to eight private and parochial schools, because you can't treat one group of students different than another group of students. So if you want to reduce the mileage from two miles to one mile, it must be for all students in district and private and parochial. So in order to do this, we did an analysis based on our current enrollment. And we identified there are 70 students that would be eligible 
for transportation, if we decreased it from two miles to one mile, that transportation to either the junior, senior high school, due to the little, there's a little section in Bay Park area that's more than one mile, but less than two miles, that little group of students would get a, bar, get a uh, transportation, and then there are students in two other private and parochial schools that would get transportation as well. Uh, correct. Not correct. And so based on those 70 students and where they live and what schools they attend, it would require that the district contracts out for an additional van, an additional bus, and increases a vehicle that right now is a van um, to a bus because by going from two miles to one mile, that particular parochial school is increasing the amount of students that get transportation. Well, it's individual. It, it, it's based on the residents and, and you know, it's not one person. She, you know, the one person put a petition out. You need to get a certain required amount of signatures, and that required amount of board policy has been met. And so we are we respect the community, and now it's a community's decision. And so, what is the impact of this proposition? Should it pass, it will increase our the budget that we proposed will go up by one hundred forty six thousand one seventy eight, and that was calculated based on the current year's contractual cost for buses. We don't know what next year is going to be, you know, because we're waiting for CPI and we go out for buses every year. It could be more than that. But right now, based on this proposition, it's $146,000 increase. It takes the le tax levy, will increase from 0.93 to 1.39% because we have to uh, levy for the additional money. And then the yearly impact to the um, average homeowner goes from $101 to $151. So, you know, we're only, um, the current budget that we're proposing is less than a $300,000 increase in the tax levy. This is another 146, it's almost 50% more than what we originally proposed. <laughs> okay. So, this is our ballot. It's very small, very hard to read. But I thought it was really important to point out that it's very important that the community vote for everything on this ballot. So proposition one, which is up at the top, is for the vote, the annual, the annual budget. We have to say yes or no, you approve or you disapprove. Down in the bottom right-hand corner, those are our trustees. So you should vote for that as well. But when we're talking about propositions, proposition two, you need to either say yes or no for the technology reserve. That's the $100,000 to support the technology hardware replacement. Proposition three is to establish that capital reserve. And then proposition four is to expand the transportation eligibility. So every single one of the propositions must be voted on. So if you just vote for the budget, then you're not voting for anything else. So you should vote for every single proposition. That you should vote for every proposition? Absolutely. You should voice your opinion. Let us hear you. No, that's not my role. That's your role. Um, so what happens, I hate this part, what happens if the budget goes down? Well, it's kind of silly. It's only a $300,000 increase. But what happens if the budget goes down? We can have a revote on the third Tuesday of June. Um, and the board has three options. We can reduce the budget that we proposed and go out with a different number on June 21st. We can just put the same number out and let you revote on June 21st, or we could just go strictly to contingency and not have a second vote because the second vote does cost money. So, what are the rules on contingency? If we should fall under a contingency budget, the tax levy cannot be increased. So, that 0.93% increase would turn to zero. 
this would require that we reduce the budget by $295,000. And non-contingent items would have to be removed, which means all equipment would have to be removed, transfer the capital for building improvements, so that money that we were talking about for the playgrounds would be removed. Uh, student supplies that can be purchased by parents and guardians has to be removed. And then community use of our facilities would have to require a fee. We could not allow our community to use our facilities free of charge. Um, so that's what the contingency rules are. So in summary, we have four propositions on the ballot. Each and every one of them must be voted on or should be voted on individually. Um, the budget the budget increase is 2.08%. Um, tax levy is 0.93. And a contingency budget would mean a reduction of $295,000. And there is our vote. It's been changed. Please note, it's been changed to 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. Um, it used to be start at 6.30, end at 9.30. We had very little turnout in the hour, half hour in the morning and half an hour at night. So now the vote is between 7 a.m. and 9 p.m. Questions? <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> Yeah, we, we would love to. We are going to do an energy performance yep, contract be now to speak that to the that. bond is done. And so there will be an opportunity to look for some energy cost savings at that time. Yes. Yeah, so um, the reason we held off with a solar panels is because with an energy performance contract, it, it guarantees that the money we save in energy offsets the total cost of the upgrades to the building. So when we gave it a lot of thought, we were going to start with an energy performance contract initially and then go to the bond. And when you really thought about it, it made no sense because we replaced all the heating air conditioning throughout the district, right? Which will reduce on its own the energy. So cost. So when you do an energy performance contract, they do an analysis on your expenditures on energy and then they guarantee that it will be reduced by a certain amount of money with these upgrades. Solar is one of the ones that we definitely have our minds set on. Um, but I don't want it to be compared about against our inefficient energy systems right now, our inefficient heating system. I wanted to put our efficient heating system in first and then make them develop a plan in which they would save even more energy for us to offset the plan, offset the cost of solar, all the LED lighting inside the district. So we kind of strategically placed it to benefit the taxpayers. Um, the voters um, approved expending additional funds from the bond that were not used to um, improve the uh, HVAC systems in both the elementary schools. So down the road, there will not be window air conditioners. Yeah, anymore. that's our goal. There will be efficient systems at both elementary schools, much like we're putting in the high school here. But that will not happen this year. It will be ha happen in subsequent years. Are these rules going to be built in the wall? They're all going to be part of heating and air conditioning with the units in the system. So the, all the window air conditioners will be removed. When you voted in the fall, that, that's, that was a rule. They have that down there. Yes, that's what it's like. Yes, that's what they're going to do here. This building should be done um, in, hopefully, the end, the, the end of the summer, so that when we open up in the fall, 
There'll be no window conditioners. There'll be like the unit vents on the walls, which will do both heating and air conditioning. And then we hope to expand that and complete that in both elementary buildings next year. Yes, they're putting in, the, they're currently putting in the pipes now in, in various places in this building. And they're going to be taking out all of the old system and then Many of these units have already been delivered. You'll see big boxes around the- Yeah, there's boxes all over the district, yeah. That contain the units that yeah. will be installed. Is that actually going to be like putting a, a ladder out the window, uh, out the door for the building? No. Structural nope. No. no, it's all inside the building. Yeah. So that is, you know, so we, we talked about an energy performance contract, I believe in 2017, and- we gave it a lot of thought, like we do with everything in the district. We do. We think about long term. We think about what's in the best interest of the district and what's going to be financially the best thing uh, process. And so we swapped it and we decided let's do our bond first. Let's reduce our energy costs, and then let's make it a little bit more difficult um, for the energy performance contractor to offset and find other ways for us to save money because I didn't want it based on inefficient energy systems at the moment. So that will be step, actually phase, phase three, because we're, we're gonna have phase two will be the elementary buildings. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we got a lot, we, yeah. We designed it for this building and um, we did a wing, um, kindergarten wing over in a uh, center um, and we did a couple of the, the uh, library, no, not the library, the auditorium or the AP room. Um, the li the library. yeah. And center had it in the library. Oh, we the did, library. no, yeah, the we did the AP room and the gymnasium in center, as well as the kindergarten classroom. That was what the initial bond covered. And in rain, we were doing the library and, um, the, uh, gymnasium oh, and cafeteria, right? So then when we were coming on the budget and we were concerned uh, about the ventilation with the COVID and everything, we just went back out to the community and we asked to expand um, so that we can complete all three buildings with completely new heating and ventilation, removal of all air condition, window air conditioners, and really drastically improve the ventilation as well as improve the heating and air conditioning and reduce our energy costs. Well, we go out to bid. By law, we're required to go out to bid. So we haven't gone out to bid for um, Rame and Center yet. So, okay. So to answer your previous question, the graduating class this year is around 89 students. <coughs> we have approximately 50 students at this time receiving um, ENL services. Oh, wow. Yeah, she knows her stuff. <laughs> about that. Yes. One last thing. <laughs> I would like to see him leave the door open for either just the gate or the whole and door. door. You did a beautiful job on that steel. I don't think there's anybody in this room or in your neighborhood that would complain about that, that steel. He did the track excellently. He put resources in it and he did a tremendous job. But <laughs> I have a neighbor who street from Levinson and he wants to bring his kids over there to play on. And he says it's locked up on the weekend. And I said, well, if I get here, I will mention to you that you should be able to use the deal if you pay for it. It should not be locked up on the weekend unless there's uh, an event happening. So I will certainly look into that. It yeah, should not. There is something on our website. Um, there's a QR code that if you scan it, or you will, you'll be able to see what the athletic schedule is. And that would be the only time that it's not available because for safety reasons, we wouldn't want people walking the track while there's a softball game or something going on. But other than that, the field will be open until 9, 9 p.m. Mm -hmm. and then on Saturdays as well. So there is a schedule as to when, yeah. So if, if it continues, you should call, call my office um, and we will certainly look into it. I will. <laughs>
Mr. Spear, I understand that Proposition 4 was submitted by petition. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like a, a board initiative, but I was curious as to why it wasn't ever discussed during budget like, advisory committee meeting. It came in very late. It came in right at the deadline. We had to react very quickly to approve it. You know, um, you have a certain date that it must be submitted by, and we got it. it was due on Monday, and we got it like Friday. So there really wasn't. We did discuss it when we approved it, um, the, the resolution, but we got it at the last minute. Yes, was that fair? So I would say, no, it has not um, been discussed. And I don't believe that we've actually, and I apologize, have had, have brought it to the Board of Education's attention. Um, now that you have brought it up, I will make sure that we discuss it. Um, but we always have money built into the budget. Got rid of that maintenance from the capital reserve. There's always money built into the budget uh, to support projects like this. So we certainly will look into it and follow up. We were also hoping to receive the proposal from the teacher uh, teachers, teacher teachers who were interested in that. And, and we, we have not yet received you know any requests. I know that there is a garden. Uh, Mrs. Kreit is, has a very, very um, active group uh, through our learning loss um, program. So we have supported um, some of a project of that type. Um, I think there's over 30 students that are that yeah. are um, participating in that. It's an enrichment program. Um, we had a great response. So through the enrichment funds, through the CARE Act and some of the, uh, the COVID funding that we received, those would be opportunities to propose those. And so um, we did have a call for proposals earlier in the year. Mr. DiTomaso is handling that. And we did receive one from Mrs. Kreit for that type of a learning experience, but we did not receive any others. So hopefully the next call we will be, um, we're asking for ideas for summer programs, um, learning law summer programs. So we've sent that out or we'll be sending it out shortly and um, hoping that some teachers will make those proposals because we can support it through those funds. So just to clarify, um, the proposal that we received was from, from Ray Nothing School. Ms. Donovan. And um, it identified, I believe, like five to seven areas that they were looking to make improvements on. Mm -hmm. And they believe that there were some preliminary, preliminary conversations that had been made with Dr. McCarthy and with Mr. Daly. Um, That's certainly an option, and we can yeah. reach out, Mr. DiTomaso, and I can reach out to Dr. MacArthur to see uh, where they are with that. Because, again, as I said, this summer we can certainly look to offer yeah, and that, and then in the fall. We will definitely rekindle that, that conversation. Is that all? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh oh, we're in the dock. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Yeah.
Thank you. Thank you.